So we are going to present now uh, the biodiversity screening that we have prepared for this project, the RTR Ranch. As they told previous, uh, in this property you can see several habitats like open water, riparian wetland, open grass, irrigated agriculture, and well, they don't have a forest, but they have some trees, so here is represented by the tree canopy. And this habitat supports several species and a group of species. This habitat are used for reproduction, feeding, nesting, shelter, resting, lots of functionalities. Based on secondary data, as we are in the preliminary phase of the project, um, we come up to this uh, species diversity. We, in this phase, we have just looked for the vertebrates, the feelings, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Uh, and then uh, we look for the sensitive aspects in this area, which are focused on threatened and endangered species. And here we could found Rivals Jumping Mouse, which is a special the species classified as threatened by the federal and state, and we mentioned also bald eagle. Uh, bald eagle has been dislisted since 2007, but is still protected by the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act and the Migratory Bird Tree Act. As you know, this is a bird symbol. Of the so we also look for the important areas. And there was information available for critical habitat and movement corridors for previous jumping mouse. For nesting, roosting, foraging and concentration areas for bald eagle. And there was also secondary data available by the fisheries and wildlife department for birds critical migratory foraging and nesting areas. So let's have a look now. This is a previous middle jumping mouse. This nice guy is deep sleeping, he's hibernating. <laughs> and these are the typical habitats, very good time. <laughs> so let's have just a, a fast look or short look about the ecology because it's very important when we want to assess later on and want to mitigate. So this nice guy is an endemic small mammal from Colorado and Wyoming in North America. He's a largely nocturnal mouse. His hibernation between, occurs between September, October till May, and the breeding season of mirror-jumping mouse occurs shortly after hibernation in late April or May. He lives in well developed plains, repairing vegetation with adjacent related and disturbed grassland communities and a nearby water source. It is also important to prefer that this species regularly range outward into adjacent uplands to feed and hibernate. Concerning the threats, we identify the habitat alteration, degradation, loss and fragmentation resulting from urban development, flood control, water development, agriculture and other human uses. Habitat destruction may impact an individual previous mouse directly or by destroying nest sites, food resources and hibernation sites, by disrupting behavior or by forming a barrier to the movement. Habitat destruction that will result from addressing social events associated with RTR property must be properly integrated into the impact assessment. Here we have some maps like available by the federal entities. And we can see when we do a zoom to the property that almost 70% of this property is classified as critical habitat for the purpose. And when we overlap the expansion, the high expansion, we can see that it's predicted a 10% loss of this habitat. And we when we do the same uh, with the bike path, we can see that it is estimated that 4% of this critical habitat will be lost. Now, there is all also available information about movement corridors. And here you can see uh, in the southeast of the area that uh, one corridor uh, will be 
from the affected. But we have another identified, it, it's a spot, it's not a corridor, and it's important to say that this work uh, was made at a, a big scale, okay? So when you go to a uh, property, you must study the area with more detail. So this is uh, an automatic uh, methodology that they, they use. So this point doesn't represent, obviously, the corridor. It's about methodology of doing this kind of assessment. So if we overlap, it's not expected that the highway expansion will affect any movement corridor, and the bike path will affect only one, or at least overall, if affected or not, we shall see later. So, Bold Eagle. I don't know. We'll talk about it. Yeah. It's not about the Bold Eagle, it's about the device. If you are, if you can get Give us some more in details on the methodology used to, to make so, this uh, it, it is important to say, and maybe I didn't make this clear enough, this is just a screening. We just use secondary data. This is the first approach because the RTR property uh, asks us for, you know, getting just an overview to understand what problems would, may come. And in this phase, we are only using uh, secondary data. So. This material was all collected by uh, the official entities of the country. This is no field work done by us. So this is what was available. And, well, we, I don't have details about the way how they use information. What I imagine is that they use probably parameters like uh, vegetation, okay? And comparing with the characteristics and the needs of this species, they overlap because if you can see in the slide, previous slide, you look and it looks like the city of East Portugal. So the uh, catchment, yes. river basin, river basin catchment, uh, the rivers. Okay, so you can see probably they use the riparian vegetation and so on. So as you do this automatically and with this big scale, when you do what I have done, that it was a zoom for the area, what you see well, is information that must be accurate and confirmed in the local. So this is the, the objective of this uh, first screening, is just to understand if we have potential uh, problems, okay? So, I don't know if, well, I don't respond exactly to your question. We must ask the department how did they do the work, but I imagine that it was related more or less. So, are you happy for now? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, well, it's an ornithology, so when I put the bald eagle, I saw. Cool. One second, and it's already making questions? I'm going to invite you to the floor. <laughs> so, I don't know how to say it, but I think you will help me. I'll leave it to the Cosetons. Is that good enough? <laughs> so, let's see if uh, Google knows a little bit about ecology. So, Old Eagle uh, is uh, endemic to North America. Some seem far from water large rivers, lakes, and seagulls, and in Colorado, where this property is located, they are often found near reservoirs and streams. They are opportunistic carnivores with capacity to consume a great variety of prey, but subsist mainly on fish. The nests are usually built in tall trees, high above the realm, and often near water. And well, usually they age trees with a, a few leaves uh, because then they can see better and they go looking for them. The female lays one to three eggs. The incubation is about 35 days with the male and the female both keeping the eggs warm. And the sexual maturity occurs about four to five years. The lifespan, uh, well, at least in nature, is around 20 years. But in South Florida, uh, it was found the uh, oldest bird with 38 years old. So, wow. so when we look to the threats, we can see habitat destruction, illegal shooting, and pesticide poisoning. And it's important, as we are talking about potentially uh, activity that have a period of uh, construction, it's important to say that if development activities are too close during the nesting period, the eel's nest will fail, or there is a probability of it happening. 
So in the precautionary way, uh, eagles uh, should have been like, uh, half mile buffer during the bird's nesting period, which occurs between 15 October and 31 July. So these specific attributes must be integrated into the impacts of the RTM. This was also, as I will say again, just to make it clear, all secondary information. The department works a lot and have lots of map in the internet that everyone can uh, see and can access. So we can see that there are no nests registered in the study area, in the property, in RTR Ranch. But we have in a buffer of four miles, three nests, which is quite interesting. Looking for roost areas, we can see that uh, more or less 8% of the area is covered by these roost areas. If we overlap the highway expansion, it is expected to present loss of this area and with the bike path 0.5%, which are quite so low values. Looking about the use that Bald Eagle does uh, in the winter, uh, we can see that what all the property is included, is it covered by range and forage winter areas, but not by concentration in the winter. If you look to the summer information that was available, you can see that all the property is covered by forage summer areas, all in the margin. So, there was also available in the screening that we have been doing, uh, there was also a map about migratory birds. And you can see that all the property is included in birds' critical migratory foraging areas. And once again, inside the area, we don't have registered any nests, but uh, in the surrounding, there is several nesting areas, so this is an issue that um, in the future, if we have to go to the phase of the impact assessment, these issues must be addressed. So, what improvements can RTR do for biodiversity? And as this is a preliminary phase, we just give here some ideas for the opponents that are thinking about it, and well, they want to do this the best way because uh, the main objectives that they have is to keep the activity they are, are still having. So, that's one of the main reasons of the care. So, they could work on improvement of existing repairing vegetation in the streams and when it's inside the study area. Could avoid the Prevost corridor fragmentation, doing an elevated passage where the bike path crossed the Prevost critical habitat. They could promote fish abundance in the lakes, increasing food availability for bald eagle, but without compromising water fauna communities. And for example, they can also create a covert with dry latches to restore or enhance connectivity for Prevost corridor and indirectly benefiting also other animals. So here, um, in this preliminary phase, I don't believe, but the assessment will show that, that we are going to have significant impacts. But even so, uh, I think it's important to consider, and as our client is very available and good willing to do some improvements in the area, uh, we could suggest that the, for the areas that are going to be affected, uh, the circles in orange, you can see, is going to be the wetlands that are going to be lost. But uh, we could uh, create a repairing vegetation around the lakes without vegetation, achieving not only not at loss, because you see that what is replaced is much more than what is affected, but even a net gain for this situation. And also, with the trees that are going to cut off for the highway expansion. Uh, we create a noise screen with the tree walls with local suitable species, maybe the same species that were taken from the highway expansion. So, again, the yellow circles, or oval, or oval uh, are going to be cut, and the lines represent the areas where we suggest to have these barriers. If during the field work 
that is going to be done. The presence of pebbles is confirmed. Biological assessments must be completed to address the avoidance, the impacts and scale mitigation. And this comment is here because the, one of the last slides of Scott about the mining in the area. So that area probably is not potential to the pebbles. Even so, if we confirm that they are in the field, the correct, uh, well, it will be addressed during the impact assessment. So in the overall, by understanding the local biodiversity and adopting the appropriate measures, it is possible not only achieve no net loss, but even net gain. And well, these are the preliminary recommendations to RTR to address the current social demands. So, if you have any particular question, please be my guest. If not, I will pass the word to Jim.